Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, my name is Michael Zweig, and I just have organized this because a very old and dear friend of mine, John Weeks, is in town just for a couple days. Johnny and I have known each other uh, well over 50 years. We uh, were together founding the Union for Radical Political Economics back in 1966, 67, 68 in Ann Arbor, and we've been carrying on ever since and been in touch with our carryings on. And John has been, for the last uh, 25 or 30 years or so, in the UK. He taught uh, for most of that time at the University of London School of uh, Oriental and African Studies. As an economist, has been involved with the United Nations and with all kinds of studies around the world, with specialists, done a lot of work in Latin America, also in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, more recently has been involved in the uh, Labor Party upsurge in uh, the UK. He's been working very closely with the Corbynite uh, wing of the Labor Party and in the last year or year and a half has been involved in developing policy uh, around Brexit and a whole range of other questions dealing with economic matters on behalf of the Labor Party or working with the Labor Party specifically and, in, and most, most closely with the uh, uh, Shadow Chancellor uh, John McDonnell but also uh, meeting occasionally with Corbyn himself and with other people and with European counterparts in all of that in the EU. So John is just in town for a couple of days and uh, when I found out he was coming I, I thought well let's just do something whatever we can pull together and I want to thank the uh, uh, college or the what are we called School, of labor, and School urban study. Uh, of labor and Urban <laughs> Studies a uh, fine institution for sure and uh, this is uh, a venue that we've gotten uh, with great appreciation to Paul and to Michael out in the hall and others here who have made this possible for us. Uh, there is some uh, refreshments there. There's a hat, you know, when you pass the hat. I'm not passing it, I'm putting it. But if you can uh, uh, put, put in a few, sh a few dollars in there, that would be nice. Uh, but without any further ado, uh, John Weeks, here he is. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank <coughs> Kenny for providing uh, the space and thank all of you for coming on uh, International Women's Day when there are other probably uh, better things to do. But I'll um, adhere to um, the advice of Franklin Roosevelt gave one of his sons about speaking. I think some of us are old enough to remember Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> I was born in his fourth term. Uh, the, um, um, his advice was, when you speak, be clear, be concise, be seated. Uh, and I think um, uh, certainly the greatest um, American uh, speeches by American politicians have been very, very brief. So, so I'll leave time for um, um, plenty of time for questions because this is, of course, a quite uh, controversial subject. Um, let me say a little bit about my expertise. I'm not at home, uh, uh, you know, uh, bragging about what I've done, but I want to show you that I just haven't wandered it off the street on this, um, that um, I, um, I've done two reports on European Union reform, both funded by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation of the uh, uh, German political party, left party, Die Linke, uh, those are both out. If anybody wants a, uh, a link to them, you can get them online. I quite, quite, twice appeared uh, before the Bundestag, once before the uh, uh, European Affairs Committee, and once speaking to the uh, 65 or so uh, members of um, the Bundestag uh, from uh, uh, Die Linke. I supported Remain. That is still my preference. Um, my um, member of parliament is Keir Starmer, who is the shadow uh, Brexit uh, uh, secretary. I support uh, uh, the European Union. I have never done it. I have never argued for its economic advantages, which I think are very ambiguous. The main, the strongest reason for being in favor of European integration is to try to 
uh, contain and discourage uh, European governments from starting wars against each other and starting wars against other countries. Uh, I don't even, uh, while I laud its rules on um, uh, human rights and on women's rights, uh, I do not overwhelmingly stress that either. And the reason for that is that um, the one reason that Britain does not have as strong laws as the EU is precisely because it joined the EU and those EU laws then uh, in that area uh, override uh, uh, national laws. Uh, and should Britain leave, it would not be the case that all those would be lost if there were a labored government. If so, a labor government would rein, uh, reinforce uh, uh, those. So the women's rights issue, EU, for its credit, uh, started that uh, quite early in the mid-1970s. And um, then um, uh, I think that impact was much more important in uh, some member states than in others, uh, particularly in Italy it was uh, uh, of some uh, importance. Uh, we should also note that since its beginning, uh, the European Union has changed profoundly. Uh, early on, the European Union was a organization of cooperation. Uh, this is practically quoting from uh, uh, the, what um, the French foreign minister Schumacher in the late 1940s wrote. It's an organization of cooperation in order to reduce conflict among member states. And it was felt that the concentration of industry, and particularly in heavy industry, was a source of uh, uh, conflict uh, in Europe, and that's why they began with the, um, the first step was the European coal and iron uh, uh, community, which then became the, uh, the European uh, economic uh, community, and finally the, uh, the Euro European Union. However, with the uh, succession of treaties, um, particularly in the 1980s, and the two most recent treaties, with all of the European Union treaties have been incorporated basically into two, one called the Treaty on the European Union, and the other one called the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Uh, there are very clear neoliberal elements have been introduced there, and primarily as a result of pressure from two governments, the German government, and the British government. <coughs> and these, uh, though some of them the British government wasn't so keen on. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> so I, I can go into those, but for example, in the, pre in the prelude, uh, the, I think it's the first paragraph, uh, the Treaty on European Union, it states that the goal of the European Union is to establish a competitive social market economy. I, the, as far as I, I, I did this research with a, uh, a British lawyer, it is the only constitution other than the, than the Chinese constitution which specifies the economic system of, of the country, uh, that directly specifies it. You could say the U.S. Constitution by some of the statements on private property and so on, indirectly specifies it, but the European Union specifies it explicitly. Okay, now, the um, relevant to Universal, uh, to Women's Day, is that the two major protagonists in the uh, Brexit issue are both women. Uh, Angela Merkel, who basically sets policy for the European Union. Uh, she has become very adept at creating uh, consensus around German positions, and that usually involves the uh, other countries accepting the German position on economic issues, and for which they are uh, compensated with um, uh, moves toward greater uh, economic uh, uh, integration. And of course, the others, uh, Theresa May. 
both women of the right, no question about that, uh, though uh, probably about the same uh, ideological position, uh, though Merkel did have a very, um, um, I'd say, progressive moment on immigration when uh, uh, several years ago, which she has now been forced to back off of. Okay, well, let me try to begin by specifying, well, I've already begun, and let me by next, um, the, um, um, look at the current political situation. I would say it's not, in my opinion, every actor, every party to the Brexit debate is short-sighted, duplicitous, and uh, hypocritical, with the exception of the Labour Party leadership, which unfortunately I think has the wrong position. <laughs> so um, while I think its position is principled, it is uh, not the position, and I'll come back uh, to that. Okay. The, um, the only way to understand the, uh, the, the best way to view uh, uh, the debate over Brexit is to see it as a morality play. With each, it's like a medieval morality play. It's good versus evil. So if you're a Remainer, the other side is evil. They, they will destroy Britain as a result of getting out of the Union. There will be you know, massive queues of uh, uh, lorries at the, or tr trucks uh, uh, at, the, at the docks. Uh, uh, trying to unload and uh, sh transship things to the European Union. There will be a massive shortage of drugs and people will die as a result of it. Uh, you won't be able to take your dogs and cats to the continent and got just about everything you can imagine. While the other side, of course, pr uh, portrays the mere image of that, um, uh, Britain is in the thrall of a European super state, and as a result of that, uh, it uh, cannot uh, determine its own fate. And uh, also, the, um, uh, the um, levers have been very successful in, purport, in propounding the falsehood, the lie, that the European Union encourages uh, migration, which it doesn't. It has very strict external uh, migration laws, but it has free movement within the, the European Union. So somehow you have to get out of the morality play in order to understand it. And um, the, um, I think the way to do that is to look at the positions of each of the major protagonists. The European Union, from the beginning, uh, its position was absolutely clear. Uh, if some of you may read uh, uh, the online magazine Politico EU, which I strongly recommend. It's very pro-European Union, but it is, uh, the news is very accurate. It's politico.eu. Uh, and um, the, um, the position of German, of the German government and the French government was we must make leaving the European Union as difficult and costly as possible for fear that others will follow. And the particular one, uh, the Germans and the French, well, but particularly the Germans, were worried about was Italy, where you had a very strong uh, right-wing uh, movement, an ambiguous uh, movement in the Five Star Movement, which actually was campaigning for a referendum in Italy on leaving the European Union, which they have now dropped. I think that in as far as the goal of uh, Merkel and other European leaders was to frighten other governments into not pursuing leaving the European Union, they have been, I would say, almost totally successful. Uh, okay, and um, the... Um, what was the mechanism by which to achieve that? I mean, in which to make it as difficult as possible. That also is fairly clear. A, um, uh, uh, there, were, there was an article by a former 
uh, Romanian uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, which said that the, dis the key decision on the European Union side was, was to demand that the Irish border issue be sorted out before anything else could be <coughs> agreed. Now, now let me say, all, all probable outcomes, and all, as I'll talk about probable outcomes at the end, for all probable outcomes, the Irish border issue is of no importance. Because they all involve, the problem with whether there's a hard or soft border with Ireland, uh, between uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland or Ire, is the question of the movement of goods, whether or not goods would have to. The, the que movement of people is not an issue. There's been almost free movement of people between Britain and um, uh, Ireland ever since independence, except during the worst of the um, uh, uh, Northern Ireland insurrection when there were fighters coming from the, uh, from the south. And the south was offering if. Uh, a safe haven. The Labour Party proposal for Brexit involves a custom union, which would involve no checks with the Irish. Theresa May's involve a, a customs union, no border checks. Um, so the, if the European Union had said, as, as actually the German Social Democrat le leader wanted them to do, uh, uh, the German Social Democrat position was, Britain has always been a pain in the neck in uh, the European Union. They've always pushed for right-wing positions, um, uh, even Blair. Let them go. And the way to let them go is <coughs> say we'll postpone the uh, Irish question until later. But, uh, but uh, that, was, um, uh, that was rejected. The UK position that's fairly clear, too. And to a certain extent, what we see is shadow boxing. The most important economic interest in Britain is financial capital, by far. It is far more important than manufacturing. <coughs> the, um, uh, it, uh, and its interest is in maintaining access to the European Union. And interestingly enough, is in the discussions that have gone on for the last two years, the role of the financial sector has been completely absent. And that is because there's a separate agreement being reached on financial access, which is in general appears to be favorable uh, to the British financial interests. And partly the reason that it's favorable is because the, um, uh, uh, particularly Merkel's government, also to a certain extent the French government, recognize that uh, <coughs> it would be dangerous to have an extremely powerful financial center outside the, Euro uh, outside the European Union <coughs> because, uh, for, for many reasons I can go back into. Okay, so what we see, as in all major negotiations, they appear to be negotiations between governments, but they are in actuality process by which major economic interests are trying to negotiate a uh, common position. And those major economic interests are German industrial capital and British financial uh, capital. Um, I can recall when I uh, gave testimony before the EU, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Bundestag, um, <coughs> I sat next to the, um, the chair of uh, uh, the German Industrial Association. I think it's probably the most important person I've ever sat next to, uh, <coughs> who spoke perfect English. <coughs> and his testimony was, this was uh, in April uh, 2017, 
when we each had five minutes to speak, and he said, um, German industry, uh, it doesn't matter to us whether or not we concede on uh, <coughs> uh, free movement. Uh, that, is, that is not our concern. He said, the, if the British don't want free movement, then just, they're just losing cheap labor. Let them lose cheap labor. It's their advantage. Uh, the, um, uh, and interestingly enough, one of the red lines, allegedly, for the European Union is that it would never concede on freedom of movement. The, the agreement May reached eliminates free movement. <coughs> Potentially, Britain could require, under Theresa May's agreement, could require visas for all, uh, for all EU visitors, though they probably wouldn't because of the, um, uh, 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 the tourist implications. Uh, and could require work permits, which they probably would do. Okay, let's move to the um, minor players. I mean, it goes from bad to worse. Uh, the, uh, the Scottish nationalist position is they, while, the, <coughs> while uh, Nicola Sturgeon, who is the uh, First Minister of uh, Scotland, is probably Britain's most astute politician. Um, uh, she is nominally for a deal in which Britain stays in the European Union. In practice, she is for the British government negotiating an exit from the European Union and then Scotland overwhelmingly voted remain in the European Union. Then she would call an independence vote. <coughs> the, um, the Irish uh, nationalist Sinn, Sinn Féin, uh, I, was at, I was at a meeting where, again, the, <coughs> I, I don't say this so you'll see all the important places I've been, but just so you, I didn't make it up, you know, because some of it you'd say, he must have made that up. <coughs> <coughs> Sinn Féin has um, five parliamentary seats in Britain. They don't take them because their position is they will not swear allegiance to the crown uh, <coughs> and a uh, reasonable enough position, I think, to take. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> their position on Brexit is they want a crash out, which would then, Northern Ireland voted very strongly to remain in the European Union. They want to crash out and then call a um, referendum to unite Ireland. Now, I think it's a fantasy. Uh, uh, Northern Ireland is overwhelmingly Protestant. Yes, less than, say, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, but overwhelmingly the possibility of them winning such a referendum uh, is, is, very, uh, is very slight, though their technique would be to hold a island-wide referendum uh, uh, by some uh, 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 means or other. And then finally, the party that keeps um, Theresa May in power, the uh, Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland. This is a very right-wing party. It's against abortion. It's against gay marriage. Uh, it's a racist party. Uh, it, it was the far right of the Protestant uh, spectrum. They favor remaining in the European Union because they fear, I don't think that they really fear that a referendum would uh, unite, the Ireland, <laughs> unite Ireland, but they're afraid that there might be a disruption of the status quo in which they have many privileges which would not be tolerated, which are not tolerated anywhere in the EU. So in Northern Ireland, abortion is illegal, uh, the uh, gay marriage is illegal, uh, so on. Okay. Splits in the major parties, because there's a lot of press about that. Um, the Conservative Party is, cons is directly split over what position to take with the European Union. That's what the split is about. 
Uh, you have the far right of the party, uh, which wants uh, its dream is to fulfill the Thatcherite uh, revolution. And the way to do that is to get out of the European Union, which has a lot of uh, annoying regulations that protect the environment and protect labor and protect women and, and, and impose more costs, or so they think, on employers. So they want to get out and deregulate. That's where they're going. The mainstream of the party is less split, but there are many of the MPs who would otherwise support uh, remaining are from districts which <coughs> voted to leave. So, <coughs> but still, the, the main split in the party is this rather small faction. Uh, uh, the party has uh, 306 MPs. Uh, the, the far right, maybe it has 25. But the government couldn't last one day without them. <coughs> so, so Theresa May has to keep them, uh, keep them on board. The Labour Party split is not basically about the EU. That is, uh, you might say, a surrogate for a much deeper split, and that split is between neoliberalism and social democracy. The vast majority of Labour MPs are holdovers from the Blair period, Blair and uh, Gordon Brown period. Um, for these people, the labor leadership and its position are completely abhorrent. And since Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the party, and more importantly, since the left took over the leadership of the party, and if anyone's interested in the question and answer period, I'll <coughs> discuss how that, uh, how that happened. Um, uh, and he can't be removed. Uh, the left leadership cannot be removed through under party rules because it's one person, one vote, and uh, the left has overwhelming support uh, in, uh, in the party and had overwhelming support uh, in the country, too. It did very well in the election. So how are you going to get rid of uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the left if you can't go after him directly? Because they did try that. They did try a new leadership uh, challenge, and Corbyn won by a bit more than he won the first time. First thing they tried was to portray Corbyn as a security risk, that uh, uh, in the 70s and 80s he had been too close to the communists and uh, couldn't be trusted. <coughs> that didn't go anywhere, really. Uh, uh, that didn't gain any traction. The second uh, tried was that Corbyn was an anti-Semite. And that's played very well, actually, in the press, played extremely well. And the third is the European Union, that he is a ideologically opposed to uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, and um, that the, the I think the, uh, there were two elements to the strategy. One is to get the party to split, which it didn't. It, you might say it, it splintered, right? So of Labour's uh, uh, 278 MPs, uh, eight left, and, uh, the, and with three leaving the, uh, the Conservatives to form something called the uh, Independent Group. So the... Certainly, the people opposed to Corbyn, almost all of them won't remain in the European Union. That's because they see the European Union as a, a sort of a regional globalization, see? Uh, no tariffs, uh, uh, no limits on capital flows, uh, free, free movement of labor. Uh, but um, uh, if they had their choice, leaving, remaining in the European Union, with Corbyn as Prime Minister and leaving the European Union with a Labour Party back to centrism, 
they would certainly go for the latter. <laughs> okay, let me begin to. Um, I'll come back to that in the question uh, answer because it's going on quite a while. I'll be I'll be glad to, I'll be glad to talk about that because it's a big issue. Also, my my wife uh, is very much involved in that. She's involved in a group called um, Jewish Voice for Labor. Um, okay, uh, the. Um, uh, what are the options? I'll leave out my discussion of the media. We can set out a few markers to clarify, uh, to help us see what is probable and what's improbable. The Labor Party leadership will not change. Okay. We can, there is no, uh, unless there were some extreme personal scandal revealed about uh, Corbyn, which is very unlikely. He's, he's quite an austere uh, person. I mean, to fault, he's a vegetarian. He rides a bicycle uh, to work. He, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, he's never been accused of, uh, you know, any womanizing. He has the lowest MP expenses of any MP in Parliament. Uh, the, um, uh, so um, he will continue to lead the Labour Party. Further defections from Labour and from the Conservatives, in my opinion, are unlikely. So I don't think there'll be defections which would lead to a alarm in the Labour Party that they had to pressure Corbyn to resign uh, because they needed to change uh, uh, policy. Third, Merkel and German government will ensure that Britain will not leave without some kind of agreement. They've made that absolutely clear and they have the mechanism to do it too. <clears throat> the only circumstance under which that might happen, I mean, first I'll say what the mechanism is, the <coughs> Merkel has announced that she and her government are open to extending the uh, Brexit period. The deadline is the 29th of March, extending it perhaps as far as the, the end of the year. Now this is an extraordinary concession on the part, I don't know if you call it, I wouldn't call it a concession, extraordinary decision. Because in, in May, there are European elections. And the European court has held that if Britain is still in the European Union in May, there must be elections in Britain. So that would mean that you would have British members of the European Parliament in five-year terms even though Britain might leave at the end of the year. Uh, one of the strengths and one of the weaknesses of the EU is it's able to um, make these little uh, uh, compromises and they'll assume that Merkel and, uh, has some uh, compromise uh, uh, in mind. Next, second referendum. A lot of talk about the second referendum. Uh, the Labour leadership has just endorsed uh, second referendum. In my opinion, I do not think it will occur. It could, uh, under British electoral law, of course it could be changed, uh, it would take about the process of designing, campaigning, and holding an election would take about three months. The, it's certainly possible uh, if you have an extension uh, of uh, uh, the deadline, but I think it is, um, it is unlikely. I think it's unlikely because um, basically the government would have to propose legislation to hold a second referendum, and that would almost certainly bring <coughs> the end of May's government. <laughs> the uh, far right of the party would not tolerate it. 
I've said I don't think there'll be no deal. Um, there are two others. Um, the um, three others, excuse me. May's negotiation will pass Parliament. I think it unlikely. It would be a the worst outcome of all for progressives. The reason is if it passed Parliament, she would probably then call an election. She would say, I saved Britain from Brexit. They said, don't you read The Guardian? <laughs> no, I know how terrible it would have been. Even my opponents say how terrible it would have been to fall, fall out, much less the, you know, the right-wing press. And she might well win it. Uh, the um, second, there could be an indefinite uh, postponement, indefinite non-action uh, by extending um, the period of Article 50. Uh, I would say that's relatively, um, I would say that's the most likely uh, outcome, that they will continue uh, to negotiate. In summary, I think what Brexit represents is I think there's something analogous uh, in the United States, but not built around this kind of this type of issue. There are three clear political positions, both in Parliament and in the country as a whole. There is the r racist, anti-immigration, nationalist position represented by uh, the uh, uh, right wing of the Tory, Tory parliamentary party. They probably make up maybe 25% <clears throat> of the electorate. There's the mainstream, which is for the status quo in which the European Union represents the status quo. Let me just say it need not, but it does in practice represent the status quo. And then there is the radicals the, with a radical program in the Labour Party. <clears throat> and um, the polls show different things, but um, it appears that that mainstream and the um, uh, labor radical position among the public is about evenly balanced. But of course, the mainstream has the advantage that the um, far right might vote with them. Thank you very much. Just one, raise your hand if you've got a question. I can't believe that there aren't others. That's two, there's three. So, and then we'll start again. So thank you very much. That was very succinct and very clear. What could you describe at greater length what a left Brexit would look like? And does that imply that the finance sector of the British economy would be reduced or eliminated or would not dominate it in the way it currently does? Where was two? Remember your numbers. Yeah, I, you were two. Yes, yeah. Two. Um, two. <laughs> Uh, your uh, your article on uh, austerity as producing economic slowdown in Europe, born out here today's Wall Street Journal, slow growth prods central banks. So evidently, they read your article. <laughs> 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 um, it's where, before. <laughs> where where does the uh, where does the the question of um, in the British spectrum in this, and what to what extent does it play a part in the different divisions and positions and jockeying that's going on? And three was right there, I think. What do you see are the similarities and differences between the Brexit issues and Trumpism in this country? All right, well, that's a that's <laughs> one to start with. So, Johnny, uh, do it in any order you want. It's yeah. up to you. I'll take him in order. Um, left Brexit um, and, the, and the financial sector. First, um, the Labour Party position is 
uh, well, leadership of the Labor Party position is first choice is they want out and they want a customs union. Now, this is a term that can have many meanings. What they mean by it is a agreement in the movement of goods in which uh, there are no tariffs and you continue to have the regulation of the European Union. There, frequently in the British press people talk about um, uh, frictionless trade. There is no such thing as frictionless trade. The, um, uh, the European Union, to its credit, has very strict rules on what can come in and come out. It doesn't necessarily check them all, and once things get in, uh, it, it doesn't you know, uh, check every uh, cross-border uh, uh, shipment. But it does mean that it protects the consumer uh, or households uh, uh, pretty much, uh, uh, it does a reasonably go uh, uh, good job of that. Okay, so that's simply stated, that's what um, Britain would continue to um, uh, remain in, in the current trading re re uh, arrangement with, with the European Union. However, there are some specific aspects of the European treaties which a labor negotiators would request exemption from, uh, the demand exemption from. One is the uh, European Union says governments may not subsidize national firms. They, they can't subsidize any firms, in effect. It's called no state aid, which is sort of a strange uh, term, uh, uh, unexpected term for, for an American. And that includes uh, procurement. So if you want, if for example, there were, you were trying to um, uh, foster a, uh, you know, a, some kind of um, uh, uh, competitor with some of the big um, um, uh, uh, information technology companies, you would not be able to follow policy in which the government said, okay, from now on, all government agencies must buy their software from this company. Um, they would, would want to get rid of that. They would also want to uh, get rid of uh, a clause which prevents companies from cooperating, formally cooperating uh, uh, in the market. It, uh, what they have in mind is a little bit like um, uh, uh, Roosevelt's uh, National Recovery Act uh, <laughs> that uh, you should be based on not on competition. In some sectors, based on not on competition but on cooperation. Um, with regard to the finance sector, I'm going on too long. The Shadow Chancellor, uh, John McDonald, his entire career in Parliament has been built around criticisms of banks. <clears throat> there would be very strict bank regulation, or I think he would resign. Now, he's being very careful, so he's very careful not to say anything about uh, capital regulations, you know, uh, taxing short-term money flows, uh, but I think uh, that would be uh, likely to happen. Uh, and he's quite cautious on other issues, but I think that there would be attempts to um, restrict um, the power of finance. One way to do it is that the city of London, which is called, probably you know, most of you are familiar with that term, the bit is the largest money laundering center in the world. Uh, the, by, which, by which all others pale. And uh, McDonald's ad advisor is saying, one way to tame this, though New York is pretty good too, uh, the, uh, 
one way to tame this is to use the Basel rules on money laundering to go after uh, the banks. I'll be quicker on the other. Uh, austerity in British politics. Um, the Labour Party is the own, uh, only party of any size that is completely against austerity. Completely. It would um, uh, raise expenditure and um, there's some argument about whether or not it needs, uh, needs to be funded. Uh, we, we have not been plagued with a modern monetary theorist, uh, luckily. Uh, uh, but um, the, uh, there is, within John McDonald's office, a strand of uh, balanced budget uh, ideology, which uh, some of us are arguing against. So austerity plays a very big role. All of these people that split from uh, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party are um, uh, pro-austerity, or at least soft on austerity. Uh, Brexit versus Trump. There are some elements, I, I, I suppose. Um, I, I don't know. I can also vote in the U.S., but I vote in Vermont, you know, sort of. <laughs> What's the point, right? You know, you, you aren't going to bring Trump down by voting in Vermont. Uh, the, I think, I think um, uh, you know, the Democrats hold every major office. Anyway, one is that um, many people voted to leave, apparently, on the basis. Of, these, these are very imprecise surveys in Britain uh, because. Um, the votes were only reported at a regional level. So, so really all we have is exit polls uh, and uh, subsequent uh, uh, interviews. Um, it would appear that many people voted to leave because they just felt they were being cut out of the system. You know, that the, um, uh, being in the European Union was part of the status quo and the status quo wasn't doing them any favors, and uh, they wanted to say, no, I'm sick of this. That would be a similarity with Trump. Yeah, I would say that was a similarity with Trump. Then there were the over, uh, overt racists, uh, you know, that um, the, uh, 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 as my, Michael said, once Trump made it okay to use words like, you know what, uh, and, uh, Brexit to a certain, not quite so obviously, but it certainly liberated a lot of anti-immigrant feeling. Uh, so, you know, now you get, you know, you hear comments, uh, people say, you know, those bloody Poles, and uh, we got too many goddamn Hungarians around here, and th uh, things like that. So that's another, I would say that's another uh, similarity. Uh, the difference is a lot, not a lot. Some, hard to know how much. Uh, Brexit got 52%. Maybe 5% of the people who voted for it were on the left, uh, where they ranged from, uh, you know, the uh, British Ma uh, 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 Maoist party <coughs> to, uh, uh, to, uh, Friends I have that just felt that um, the European Union had become so neoliberal. Some of you may have heard of uh, the rather prominent, uh, actually she was born in the U.S., but uh, uh, Keynesian in Britain, uh, Victoria Chick. Uh, uh, she is uh, very uh, uh, anti-EU. Yeah, so I, I have two questions. I'll uh, one off. question, <laughs> please. The, the first question is just for two the about the the electoral system in the UK, but is there a way, how are folks on the left of the labor movement challenging the um, neoliberal labor party members? Is there a, a primary system? There isn't a primary system that I'm aware of, so can you explain how yeah. they might challenge um, here the way uh, left progressive socialists are doing in the US? Good, three is right here. So I'm just wondering if security experts, national security folks, uh, 
whether from the Conservative Party, uh, from the Labor Party, raised the question of whatever you think of the European Union and its neoliberal components, which are horrible, there's an underlying stability, anti-war stability aspect to it that we, we can't ignore. Is that used as an argument or is that just forgotten? And the, uh, all the other issues that you raised and others are, are, are dominant. One of the ways in which the, the whole split in the Labour Party and, uh, and in Britain in general is explained in the U.S. press is a generational one where young people are uh, in Britain are said to be very pro-European Union and very dismayed at the very idea that, that it will come apart and their EU citizenship will be, will be lost. And I'm wondering, my question, you can respond to that particularly, my question is really about does the Labour Party leadership understand at all that if it, it supports Brexit too firmly, there's a generational loss that's, that, that, that's threatened, that the party will not be able to kind of rebound or, or, or come to power if they don't deal with the generational issue? Right there. Uh, you said in, uh, in your presentation that the uh, free movement of people in the north and the south is of no importance, if I remember correctly, or of little importance. That's not the Irish view at all. Uh, in today's Irish papers, for instance, there is a uh, what's called the Gaelic Athletic Association in Ireland. It runs the Irish Indigenous Sports throughout the year. Also, the Six Nations Rugby Union champs on right now. Ireland is playing France in Dublin on, on Sunday. Now, half of the Irish Rugby Union team is made from Northern Ireland players. Now, if there's, if there's difficulty between movement of people, which is the north and the south, and as many Irish people think there will be, that's not of no importance to Irish people, so it's of huge importance. So could you elaborate a little more? And then lastly, during the negotiations two months ago, Theresa May said in the English Parliament, that the Parliament yet, do you want to united Ireland? Now could you comment on that as well? Is her mentality still colonial and tourist, or is she really a modern day politician? <laughs> All right, well that's five questions. John, you're up. Uh, first on the last one, I, I think, um, movement within the uh, Irish Island is of tremendous importance. Uh, under the labor arrangement, uh, there should be no problem uh, in, in that there would not have to be customs posts or, or uh, anything uh, uh, such as that. Uh, and um, it, it is con certainly conceivable that if a Labour government came into power and negotiated to leave the European Union, which I hope they don't, I think there's another scenario they could follow, uh, uh, negotiate leaving the European Union, that groups in Northern Ireland um, would try to foment, um, you know, uh, uh, tensions. Uh, the um, uh, so it's a real concern, I agree, but, but I think that most of the argument is if Britain goes out of the European Union, there'll be a hard barter because of the movement of goods. And I don't think uh, uh, that's true. What the other implications are, I'm not sure. This is not my area of expertise. I can say that I think the problem of the uh, uh, free movement of labor would not be difficult to... Um, 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 uh, solve what it would basically be solved by the free movement of goods. Having said that, the shadow trade minister Barry Gardner made a very unfortunate uh, uh, statement at a meeting I was at, in which he said, um, in which there are Sinn Fein people there, in which he said, um, this whole issue of the Irish border. Is, I think he used the word, I can't even pronounce it, Shimera or something, you know, Shimera. Uh, and as you can imagine, the champagne people there went through the roof, and I don't blame them, uh, but uh, uh, Corbett and McDonald and I quickly backed off that. Now, I'm going to leave any Semitism to the back uh, last because it requires more um, uh, discussion. Uh, 
the Good, Good Friday Agreement. I think the, actually, I think the biggest danger to the Good Friday Agreement is the Democratic Unionist Party. I mean, they really are terrible, you know, and um, the, uh, uh, the, the Protestants in Northern Ireland have chosen to select the most reactionary elements to uh, represent them. Uh, and um, the... Um, uh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, though they're even to the right of him now. All right. Yeah. yeah. The, um, all right, now, national security experts, that question. Uh, the, um, I uh, have a friend, he was a neighbor, uh, completely accidental that he was a friend of mine. Uh, his name was David Oman. He was the, um, he had been the head of, uh, uh, the interim head of uh, uh, GCHQ. That, that's a British equivalent of the uh, National Security Agency. And uh, then he became uh, Blair's advisor on uh, security. And uh, we, saw, we see David and his wife Liz from time to time. His view is that it is a serious problem. Uh, and uh, <coughs> that uh, leaving the EU because uh, while there's something called Interpol, which uh, you don't have to be a member of the European Union to be part of, which is, involves police cooperation, the cooperation with, uh, within the European Union on security issues and police issues is much closer. And so that would definitely be a problem that's raised from time to time, but um, it doesn't seem, I regret to say, doesn't seem to have uh, got any uh, uh, traction. Um, how do the, how do the, how does the left challenge uh, the uh, neoliberals? Um, when David Miliband was leader of the party, he was a uh, leader before uh, Jeremy Corbyn, he made two reforms. One was in order to weaken the strength of the trade unions, he introduced one person, one vote in the Labor Party. So on, uh, in the selection of um, the leader, in the selection of your uh, local MP, it's one person, one vote. This is probably the, the best example of, uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> unanticipated consequences, because it's true, it did weaken the, uh, uh, the trade unions who had a block vote, but the result was to liberate all of these loony lefties in the, in the Labor Party who had all wanted social democracy. And so the other um, thing that protected the neoliberals is that the uh, practice in um, the Labor Party in the longest time has been that if you were a sitting MP, you automatically were selected to stand as the MP in the next round. There was no primary. Uh, there, was, there was no reselection uh, process. Now, because most labor MPs are anti-Corbyn, um, 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 about six months before the last general elections, we're talking about the end of 2016, uh, early um, 2017, uh, there was a, the Labor Party, what's called a constitu the Parliamentary Labor Party, 278 members, put forward a vote of no confidence on Jeremy Corbyn, and uh, 24 MPs voted against it. Think about that for a moment. So Corbyn's opponents outweigh his supporters by a factor of something like seven or eight. Not quite so uh, extreme now for two reasons. One is he did well, uh, Labor did very well in the election uh, in uh, July uh, 2017. That brought some new pro-Corbyn MPs in. 
It also made some MPs uh, say, hmm, <laughs> like, uh, like next, the MP next door uh, to me is a woman named Tulip Sadiq. Uh, she had been a sort of middle of the road uh, uh, MP. She had voted to uh, censor uh, Corbyn in, uh, as an MP. She had a majority uh, in the last, uh, in the previous election of something like 250. <coughs> the left went out and worked for her, and she came in with a majority of 10,000. And so I think Tulip probably said to herself, maybe Jeremy Corbyn's not so bad after all. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, the other element is that unfortunate term, deselection, the deselection of candidates, that is, uh, having your local MP not automatically um, uh, being uh, replaced but requiring a vote. I, I would just call it selection, but they, it's called deselection for ideological reasons. That is becoming more respectable. Uh, so th those are the mechanisms. And in my own constituency, Labor Party, it's clear that while uh, the shadow Brexit secretary, I support him, he's a very good MP, but he is to uh, the right of uh, uh, the membership, but he's partly responded to that. Uh, and um, the, uh, the councillors, for example, you know, like the city councillors, uh, are the ones that are selected uh, are uh, uh, much more progressive uh, than in the past. Anti-Semitism, this is a real, I'm trying to think of how to get into it without uh, going into great detail. First of all, there are two. There was one organization. Uh, there was an organization of mainstream Jews, which was uh, called the uh, Jewish Labor Movement. Uh, that goes way back, I think, back into the 20s, um, in the early days of the Labor Party. Uh, it is uh, prominent among these are the um, uh, the major rabbis in, um, uh, in um, uh, 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 particularly in London, uh, but also around uh, Britain. Britain has something that my wife, who is Jewish, tells me that is not common in the United States. They have a, they have a chief rabbi. Uh, and I, I think this goes back to medieval times when every uh, minority group was supposed to have a representative, uh, you know, uh, to the crown. Um, uh, she now uh, uh, heads um, uh, uh, is, a, is a nominal uh, head of that group. Then about three years ago, a uh, left-wing group um, called uh, Jewish Voice for Labor was, uh, was formed, and um, very much the uh, most of the Jewish MPs are closely aligned with the mainstream group of the uh, um, uh, Jewish labor, uh, labor movement. It is very pro-Israel. Um, um, uh, and would in general consider criticisms of the Israeli government to be close to anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, the uh, <coughs> They, well, they are not, they have not yet become critical of Netanyahu. Uh, so they, they've been very supportive of the Israeli government since uh, the, uh, the, the founding. Of course, in the early days, that was a progressive position to take. Uh, they, or at least in the context of Britain, it was a, nobody worried about expelling Arabs from land and things like that. Uh, uh, and as it's true in the United States, right? There are socialists and everything. Um, the, the, there is in Britain much more criticism of the Netanyahu government than there would be in the United States. So it is quite, um, you know, if you hold a, like my college, if you held a panel on the Middle East um, and you wanted to talk about uh, uh, Jewish-Arab relations, 
there are four people on the panel, every one of them would be anti-Netanyahu. Uh, uh, you know, there would be, uh, and, um, okay, but the, um, anyway, so. The particular vehicle by which keeps this going is um, the, the anti-Semitism accusations against Corbyn. Well, there are two things. One is he made some very unwise decisions about um, who he sat down with at uh, conferences and what conferences he went to uh, uh, when he was just a sort of MP on the left wing fringe. There's no question about that. Uh, <coughs> the um, saying quite favorable comments about uh, Hamas uh, and Hezbollah, uh, even about individuals uh, who are accused of uh, 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 <coughs> carrying out crimes uh, uh, in Israel. Um, that's a good uh, while ago, but people, you know, you dredge them up, and uh, the people say, well, has he really, has he, is he just being opportunist, or, or has he changed? That's one issue. And the other, uh, quickly, is that the accusations uh, by Jewish MPs of uh, anti-Semitic tax upon them, they have foundation. People do send tweets that say, you know, uh, there's particularly this um, quite conservative labor MP named uh, Luciana Berger, uh, who uh, quit and went with the uh, independent group. She did receive uh, um, uh, emails that said, you know, uh, we don't need a dirty Jew as a, uh, as a MP, or, you know, why don't you go back to Israel where you belong, uh, <coughs> things uh, such as that. Uh, there's been an attempt to link those to the leadership of the Labor Party. Um, and um, I think, um, <coughs> how should I put it? Because this is not my field, so I'm, I'm giving my opinion now. I think many people on the left, if I can quote not one of my favorite uh, politicians, but uh, uh, an appropriate quote, Jack Chirac, remember Jack Chirac, when um, uh, the uh, Iraq War came along, he said of the um, uh, governments uh, in uh, Central Europe, they passed up an excellent opportunity to remain silent. <coughs> and I think that's true of uh, many people on the left when these attacks come out about uh, anti-Semitism, they pass up an excellent opportunity just to let it go because you just feed it by uh, uh, talking about it. That's one thing. And the other thing is, there can be no doubt what the basic purpose here is. I think very much like what's recently happened in Congress. The purpose is to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn. That's what's driving this. <coughs> and um, that is not to say it's not a real issue, uh, but it, it's very hard to sort out what's real and what's non-real, uh, um, uh, how much of it, uh, given the political uh, tension around it. Will we have, uh, you didn't respond to my question about generation. Mm. You're quite right. I think it's exaggerated. Of course, given my age, I would, uh, <laughs> I would say that, would I? Are they, uh, um, I think there's some of that, uh, given the absence of um, uh, clear, unbiased surveys, it's hard to say. Uh, there, there is a very good writer, uh, British writer, who's uh, part of the group that I'm, uh, the Progressive Economy Forum named Danny Dorling, D-O-R-L-I-N-G. Uh, he argues that the Brexit vote was largely a class vote, uh, that there were certainly a generational element, but it was revolt of the uh, under underclasses, particularly the non-unionized uh, underclasses. 
some of which were old, some of which were young, some of which were, uh, were, uh, were neither. Yes, particularly middle class young people, they like to, you know, my, my, my son works for, he's a trade union organizer. Where is he now? He's in the, he's in the French Alps skiing. He didn't need a visa. You know, he goes on, if he, get, if he gets hurt, he has a European uh, medical card and all this sort of stuff. Um, I don't want to denigrate it, but yeah, the, but just, I think young people, they just, they grew up with the idea that you can travel all over Europe, you get a job all over Europe, and they want to stick to that, reasonable enough. Yeah. Okay, so I want to make, make it clear, make no mistake, I'm a big Jezza fan. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to come from work, so I couldn't have this, I couldn't wear this to work. Right, yeah. Sorry. It's not me, they fear it's you. Yeah. <laughs> Similar to Bernie's slogan, not me, us, which is brilliant. Um, I just want to follow up on the anti-Semitism stuff because I understand where this crap comes from. Um, it's been awful, it's been sustained, and I frankly think that Jeremy has not addressed it sufficiently and has not, you know, with this Ilhan Omar stuff, there's been a forceful left response, which I think has really worked to tamp it down to some extent. I haven't, now I'm here, I'm not there, so I'm not in the trenches, but my sense is I haven't seen anything where Jeremy just says, screw you guys, you're full of baloney, you're just doing this to destroy the left of, of labor, there's no way I'm a freaking anti-Semite, go home. I would really like to, I don't know, he doesn't need to quote me, but, you know, words <laughs> <laughs> to that effect is my point. There was a two back there. Yeah, I'm, yes. I'm just not sure what um, Corbyn's position is on Brexit and how long he's held it, because I thought he was historically um, for Brexit. Three. And, and, and is, you know, how about the Labour Party in general? I had a similar question about the anti-Semitism. I'm in the fog here about why is Corbyn being attacked. I mean, he said he did some unfortunate things. How unfortunate? What did he do? I'm not a follower of news. I mean, is it unfortunate like Trump, like stupid? Or did he um, not know what he should know? I mean, what's the deal? I don't understand. Trump. And four. Um, sorry to be a male. <laughs> no, need to apologize. Okay, a moment. no need to apologize. Uh, okay, so John, please. Uh, well, in the context. Um, John, you said earlier that uh, when the idea of uh, Britain leaving uh, came up, people in the SPD in Germany said, good, let them go, because they, they're all right-wingers and they sort of pulled down policy in the EU on, on other things. And so I wonder if Britain goes, you know, do you see any sort of um, maybe resurgence of interest in more social policy or in more sort of progressive things? For example, there was the financial transaction tax, which wouldn't have applied to the UK anyway because it was only Euro using yeah. countries, but for sure the bankers hated the whole idea. And, um, and it's kind of died. And meanwhile, we have yellow vests. We have all kinds of things happening that say maybe, you know, the time for more progressive policies would come back. Right. right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me take uh, Barry's first because um, the um, uh, others uh, sort of fold together. Um, I think it would be very, I could be wrong, I think it would be quite unfortunate for uh, um, the European Union if Britain left because uh, if we have a Labour government, which I very much hope we do, uh, it would be by far the most progressive government in the European Union. There would be nothing even near it. <clears throat> a little bit the Spanish government, but it will probably fall soon, uh, I regret to say. Um, and the, the, uh, the socialists are in power in Portugal, but uh, it's a small country. Um, they have to be very 
timid with regard to dealing with the European Union. The, um, the problem is, of course, the last thing, well, not the last thing, the leaders of the European Union definitely do not want a Corbyn-led Britain in the European Union. <coughs> the, uh, and that's part of why <coughs> they're willing to make these deals with them. Uh, uh, Theresa May. If Britain went out, would there be more flexibility for social policy? There is a movement throughout the European Union for revision of the treaties. However, um, the German government and its allies, uh, these would, the most uh, obvious ones are, um, um, are the strong, closest ones, uh, Netherlands, Finland, um, <coughs> He used to say Austria, but it's not true of Austria anymore because they have that, they have an ineffective far-right government. They have been very successful in neutralizing movements towards um, more, more socially oriented uh, policies. They have made it impossible, but I'll give you an example. The, um, Recently, uh, the, um, the Social Democratic group proposed uh, a, um, what would you call it? I'm not sure what term you use. Anyway, it would be regulations on work-life balance, and that was to um, uh, provide uh, rights of women and uh, allow flexible working hours, a number of other things. Uh, the uh, <coughs> conservatives, the European People's Party, opposed that, and so the compromise reached. I mean, this is really the history of the degeneration of the European of the social democracy in the European at the level of the European Parliament. The social democratic parties agreed to accept the fiscal rules, the draconian fiscal rules, if the right would accept the uh, uh, social charter on um, work-life balance and included a lot of other things, uh, working conditions. I think to make progress, the Social Democrats have to stop doing that. You know? They have to say, we are the opposition, line up uh, with, the, uh, with the Greens, um, the, um, and uh, with the left parties. Uh, I think there's possibility of uh, uh, progressive reform in the European Union, but a big barrier to it is many of the insurgent left parties were splits from the mainstream Social Democrats or are in direct competition with them. So, uh, <coughs> so if I, De Linke split from uh, the uh, German Social Democratic Party, in part, and it was also partly absorbed the old Communist Party. Uh, Podemos is in direct competition with uh, the uh, Spanish Socialists. These, are, um, the mainstream parties are very loath uh, to uh, to cooperate. Uh, just to give a, a, a personal example, when I and Jeremy Smith, uh, my lawyer co-author in my reports, when we applied for money to uh, the um, uh, Foundation for European Progressive Studies, FEPS, which is funded by the Social Democrats, um, they said, this is great, we, li uh, we, uh, we like it, we reviewed it. We only give 70% of the funding, you have to find another funder. Uh, so, uh, so we looked around for other funding and we uh, found that the um, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation would be keen on it. And when we came back with uh, Rosa Luxemburg and they say, uh, they say we got a, quite a rude um, email said we do, not, we do not consider them to be on the left. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's changing. I think that's changing. In uh, September there will be something called the European Forum held in Brussels. And it looks like maybe that the Social Democrats 
will at least have observers. Uh, the, the form is organized by something called Transform Europe, which is basically the, uh, uh, the, the German left party, <coughs> uh, but it also has Podemos. So I, I'm not completely pessimistic, and the purpose of our first report is to say, here's the blueprint to re rewrite the treaties. Not easy to rewrite treaties. Okay, um, uh, why doesn't Corbin, I agree with you, I mean, why doesn't Corbin just say, this is all a bunch of nonsense to uh, get rid of me in hopes that the party will go back to its old neoliberal position. And uh, sure, there's some, uh, there's some problems around, we're sorting it out, and uh, let's move on. Um, he's tried to do that, but I think not clearly enough. Uh, and, uh, but um, there needs to be, we will see. I hope that this vote in Parliament, uh, which uh, Omar self voted for, uh, <coughs> will, I mean, in the uh, House of Representatives, uh, will, um, uh, put, you know, bring that to an end. We can't bring it to an end, but we'll uh, defuse it. <coughs> we need something like that uh, in Britain. Uh, the, um, uh, there was another question about um, anti-Semitism, but I forgot. I didn't make enough notes about it. What did you ask? I asked what had he said. And oh, what did he say? Uh, he met with I, uh, the things that have been focused on. I can't remember all. Things have been focused on. He's, he was photographed. He'd gone to a conference organized by uh, uh, Palestinian groups that included um, Hamas. A conference in Tunisia, uh, I guess Morocco. And there's, that's where the... Um, uh, the people who murdered the the, Jew, the, uh, the Jewish uh, Olympic team in what, what was oh, it Munich. in Munich, yeah, uh, are buried, and there, there's a monument there to him, and he, a picture of him was taken that could be interpreted as him standing at the monument. <laughs> he denies it. <clears throat> He said, that because there's also someone else buried near the, uh, there, I can't remember who, some Algerian uh, leader of the Al Algerian left. <clears throat> so that got big play. Corbin, you know, uh, honors uh, the murderers of Munich. <clears throat> uh, then they're just sort of silly things that uh, figures of uh, speech uh, he was a, uh, he was at a public meeting, and uh, someone criticized him for something he said, and he said, uh, "Sometimes I think uh, British Jews don't have a sense of humor." Well, that's not something you should say, you know. I mean, really, uh, that's actually a foolish thing to say. Um, they um, uh, he later apologized for it. Uh, so they sort of very they're in that type of uh, 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 range. But the, the fundamental objection to him um, coming from the right-wing Jewish MPs and the Labor Party is that he is uh, opposed to Israel, you know, Israel not in all caps, uh, and uh, which suggests the Israeli people and all of that. Okay, what is the Labour Party's position on Brexit? People say it's not clear. I think it's pretty clear. <clears throat> Up until two weeks ago, <clears throat> the position was no second referendum. Leave with a customs union with the European Union, and we're going to negotiate about some of the uh, uh, more constraining, policy-constraining rules of um, the European treaties. That was, that was its position. There was even paper that laid out what the negotiating position would be. Now, as a result of <clears throat> changes in circumstances and pressure from the membership and these people leaving, uh, Corbyn has said that uh, the Labour Party 
will, if there's a vote on a second referendum, which includes remaining in the European Union, it would take the form, are you for Theresa May's deal? Are you against it? And if you're against it, we remain in the European Union. He said, if there's something like that, Labor will support it. But otherwise, the first priority is getting out with it and remaining customs union. Well, thank you. I think that this has been terrific. Thank you very much, John. Everybody, uh, we have another 20 minutes uh, to just hang out and be together and pick up a little more food and just to uh, come and talk to John or to each other. Thank you very much for coming and uh, upward and onward. <laughs>